right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Okay, hey everyone, and welcome to the Gift of Learning's fourth webinar in our Career Pathway series, The Pathway to Engineering. My name is Krishna Girish Kumar, and I am an outreach and social media ambassador for the Gift of Learning. Uh, the Gift of Learning team consists of our founders, Arya Nalavade, Isha Kulkarni, Amrita Rajiv, and Shivangi Gosain, our manager, Shishika Mitapali, our Anashvika Chandu, as well as our outreach, social media, graphic design, and SAT teams. Before we begin, we would like to give some background info about the Gift of Learning. The Gift of Learning is an online tutoring organization that is working towards closing the educational gap between students. Uh, you can be part of this mission and register to become a tutor. More information about the Gift of Learning can be found on our website and our social media platforms. We're active on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, so make sure to follow us there. Um, and before I introduce our guest speaker for today, I'd just like to preface that this webinar will be recorded and broadcasted on our social media platforms. So we ask that you please turn off your mics for the duration of the webinar, but uh, if you're comfortable, please do turn on your cameras, please and thank you. So let's get to the topic of today's webinar, the pathway to engineering. So throughout the webinar, if you come across any additional questions, please send them over to Isha through a private chat, and we will ask them at the end during our Q&A session. So make sure you stay for that as well. So our guest speaker today is Ms. Diana Ircheta, who is a mechanical and manufacturing engineer working as a manufacturing engineer at Burgess Norton in the Chicago suburbs. Uh, she's also the founder of Latina Engineer, which is an organization that focuses on providing educational and professional development resources in hopes to increase the representation of Latinas in the STEM fields. So, Ms. Ercheta, whenever you're ready, go, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome, everyone. I, I am going to go uh, contradict something with the uh they just said is that I do have a couple questions and I want to get involvement from everyone so I will be asking those questions and then feel free to unmute yourself when I get to that point uh but let me go ahead and share my screen oh okay there we go okay so pathway to engineering uh so they already uh, they represented me. Just another thing I guess I wanted to add was that I am an immigrant. I am originally from Mexico and I uh, moved to the United States when I was 12 years old. That's when I learned English and, you know, it was a whole transition. So I do have that experience of coming from one country to another uh, and then also, you know, adapting into, you know, a different way of school works and college and applications and things like that. So it's just kind of like a mix of, you know, being a minority, being an immigrant, being a Latina and a minority in STEM as well. So if you have any questions on that, feel free to ask them as well. Okay, so engineering. Uh, there we go. So a couple of things I'm going to cover today are the first one is exploring engineering. So kind of like what engineering exactly is because I feel like sometimes like for example when I was growing up I didn't really understand what engineering was even though my dad was an engineer my mom was also in a STEM career and I just knew that engineering was a job but I didn't really know what it was um, the second one is women in engineering uh, they one how to succeed in engineering and a little bit of engineering lifestyle how is my life or how it is just in general once you you know because it's more than just a job it becomes you know your lifestyle Okay, so what's engineering? And here's where we wanna hear some of the uh, opinions. Like, how would you describe engineering? If you wanna mute yourself and go ahead and say it, feel free to do it. Anyone willing to take the question? I'll go. Um, from my understanding, um, I don't have much understanding, but um, from what I know, it's basically, um, it's in the STEM field, obviously, engineering, so it requires some math and maybe even some science skills and like um, to be techie, like with the computer and all of that. So I know it requires all of those skills and adapting 
Um, I know there's different fields of engineering, like there's civil engineering or biomedical engineering. So it kind of depends what your interest is. Like there's kind of something for everyone if you don't want to like be outside, I guess. But yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what I hear often, you know, it's like, you know, it involves, it involves math, it involves science, but, you know, and typically as students, you know, when I was in school, nobody really liked math. I really liked it all the time. When I moved to the U.S., it was the one class that I didn't have to translate, so it was really easy for me. And it was that, like, how do you fight against, you know, all your classmates who saying, you know, math is boring or I can't do math because it's not for everyone sometimes. Uh, but more than that, you know, I see engineering as, you know, they create things that they solve problems that help, um, you know, either, you know, at their job or at the environment or, you know, just in general, the public, you know. As me, as a mechanical engineer, is more like design. I make something. I have a problem, and my solution, as far as mechanical engineers, is to make a physical product that's going to solve that issue. So, and yes, like you said, there is a lot of types of engineering. Uh, so the next question was like, how many types of engineers are there? And to be honest, I can't tell you how many there are because there are a lot. And every time we're coming up with new ones, like for example, when I was going to school, which was, uh, I graduated two years ago and I did five, so seven, um, biomedical engineering wasn't as accessible where I was. Uh, by the time I graduated, so like five years later, biomedical engineering was way more accessible than when I started. And it was one of the careers that I was interested in. So there is a lot, we're expanding, we're getting more specific into different fields and there is a field for everyone. So, you know, the next question is like, can you name five? Does number, somebody want to name five engineering types? You can just unmute yourself and like go for it and start naming all five. I could try. Um, I know there's biomedical, aerospace, um, Manufacture. Um, yeah, I'm having trouble with the last two, but <laughs> no problem. Hold on. I'm going to share something with you that I actually shared on my stories yesterday because I was trying to run a poll that uh, was asking what type of engineering field they're in. Um, so some of the ones that I named, it was some, it were, they didn't even cover all of them. So the first one was mechanical, electrical, chemical, software aerospace, biomed, biomedical engineering, civil engineering, industrial engineering, computer engineering, manufacturing, health and safety, environmental, and I have one more, petroleum. And that was just the start. I'm sorry, uh, can somebody tell me that's really loud because it's right outside my house so I can move into a different room if we need to. Sounds fine, yeah. Okay, right, they're, they're constructing right outside my house. So those were only the ones that I was able to fit into my stories. And that was 15. So there's definitely way more. So there's, like I said, there's definitely one for depending on what you like. Last question is, do you know an engineer? I myself knew my dad. He was an engineer. He's still an engineer. His career was in engineering. And I think that helped me to feel a little bit more comfortable picking that career. But to be honest, I know there's a lot of people that sometimes they just don't. Uh, not only are they might be the first person to become an engineer, but they're also maybe a minority or like a woman in engineering. So sometimes it's challenging, uh, but that's why I'm gonna cover some of the topics of like how to succeed once you pick that engineering as a career for you. Okay, so the next one, let me move uh, everyone out of the way because I can see everyone. <laughs> okay, there we go. So there's a career in STEM for everyone, which like I just said, studying engineering does not necessarily mean that your job will be you know, to be an engineer. You know, there's a lot of different options for engineering. And it's something that I really like about it, that it just gives you like a good set of skills that you can use in different areas. And you don't have to be specifically, your job title has to be this type of engineer. Uh, and also you're not stuck to, because I study mechanical engineering, I have to do mechanical engineering as my job. I myself, for example, I jump between mechanical and manufacturing all the time. So there's a lot of flexibility. Uh, engineering prepares you for a large variety of jobs. So what's engineering? Critical thinking, problem solving, curiosity because you wanna figure out how things work, why they do, or like if there's something that you can do, why can't we do it and how can we make that happen? 
And that's how I see in general, just the concept. Obviously each engineer goes into different steps. For example, if you wanna make something, let's say you wanna make a camera. I think I always use a camera as an example. How many types of engineer does it take you to build this? And I'm actually have another example later that I think you're gonna enjoy. So, you know, me as a mechanical engineer, I'm gonna design how it's gonna look and how it's gonna be assembled together. But I'm gonna need an electrical engineer to put all the electronics behind it, right? And then I'm gonna need an industrial engineer that's gonna help me in the production floor to tell me, train everyone how they're gonna assemble it, what goes where, uh, set up the area where they're gonna work. So depending on what you're making, you're gonna have all these different types of engineering coming together to make a product or to make an idea or something like that. Uh, and like I said, it gives you a set of valuable skills. Okay, so what do you, what do you need to become an engineer? So I always say, you don't need to be the smartest person in the room, you just need a passion and dedication. I myself never felt like I was really smart or anything like that. Um, and I feel like you don't have to, you know, I think a lot of the things that we see in engineering, you know, the math, the science, the physics, it can be really challenging. It can be hard to understand. When you first see it, it might be, you know, it might scare you. I mean, I was, I, every semester, I would think those classes were just gonna be impossible and I couldn't get through them. But then I will, I will work myself up to it. Every semester, my first test was always almost a failing grade. And then from there, I have to work to get to the end of the semester, getting my test will go like a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better until by the end, I felt really comfortable with the topic. So it was kind of like that learning curve and it always repeated every semester. So it was just, I had to get comfortable with figuring things out with maybe not doing so great at the beginning, but you know, still not giving up just because my first test, I got like a 40% on it, which is true, sometimes I did but working harder for the next one so that I can make that up and actually understand what I was learning because you might also get really good grades in your test, but if you don't really grab the con grasp the concept of what you're learning, then it might be a little bit difficult once you get out. So you don't have to be the smartest, you just have to have the dedication that this is my goal, this is why I like here, remind yourself why you picked this and also that you don't have to like 100% of the classes that you take. Like I myself took a bunch of different mechanical engineering classes because mechanical engineering is really broad. But for example, uh, my fluids class, I don't really use it at my job. My thermodynamics class, I might not use it as much. But for example, my SOLIDWORKS and CAD class, I use it every day. Or the sign, uh, we also had a class in the sign, I use that every day. So you get to pick kind of like what the classes are that you like. And that kind of tells you what your emphasis will be once you pick engineering. Because even if you pick, you know, a certain specific type of engineering, like electrical engineering, there's going to be many fields within that you're going to start like developing interest in where you can more specialize into or tell you what kind of area you want to work in once you're done. So what do you need to become an engineer? Creativity, curiosity, problem solving, being a challenge taker and researcher, because you're always going to be learning. Like as you finish school, you're not going to know everything you need to know your industry is going to be different from what you apply in the classroom and you're always going to be finding new things maybe even solving problems that nobody has solved before they might not seem like you're gonna uh, like end the world's hunger but there might be other problems that you might need like for example I, at my job i'm designing uh, a machine that's going to feed uh, the parts that we make one at a time and we didn't have one before we don't have anyone that can make it and i need to figure out how to do it so it's just those things that nobody has made something that works with that specific part before, but I'm gonna figure out a way to do it and I'm gonna figure it out as I go and learning on the way. And then the other thing is creativity that I know some people I have asked and they're like, do you need to be creative to be an engineer? Because I've gotten responses where maybe people say no and then some people say yes. And to me, I felt like as a design engineer more specifically, I really needed to have that creativity to see a problem and be like, this is how this is gonna look and this is how it's gonna work. And if you can't really see that, you know, that image of what it is going to, then it might be a little bit harder for you as a specific, for example, a design engineer. Okay. All right, so this is the one I like is, what type of engineer is Iron Man? I got this ask, um, I think it was a live session. Not that it was super interesting. Does anybody want to give it a shot? Nobody knows? 
You don't have to be right. Just what you think they might be. I mean, he might be. Nobody wants to answer. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you that I think this is how I want an answer. I think he is more of like a combination of different types of engineers. Uh, I know you can say like maybe robotics or something like that, but to be honest with like the amount of things that he builds and how the complexity of them, I swear he probably has a team of engineers behind him that he never shows that are helping him build out those, all those things. Because like I said, with the camera, you're gonna need more than one engineer to put it together. Okay. All right, so what do engineers do? I'm gonna do just a really quick, I'm gonna read through this one, uh, just to kind of tell you a little bit about what different type of engineer, and these are just like the most popular, but there's definitely more that you can research and there's a lot of information out there that you can find. So mechanical engineering, they're responsible for designing and manufacturing products and machines. Electrical engineering, they work on electrical components, devices, and systems. Industrial engineering, or also sometimes it's really similar to manufacturing engineering, they design equipment, buildings, information systems, etc. They help run projects and manufacturing process. So sometimes they might be the ones doing training and things like that. Uh, chemical engineering. Oh, I have chemical engineering twice. Use engineering and science to aid in the processing of food, create industrial uh, chemicals, and make pharmaceuticals. Uh, and then the last one is supposed to be civil engineering. Uh, they're responsible for city and country uh, country infrastructure, including uh, creating roads, bridges, uh, dams, and buildings. Okay, so let's jump to the second part of this. It's women in engineering, which I really like to talk about and which is kind of like I, what I focus on on my page. So women live in engineering after 10 years. So about 10%, uh, there's a lot of women that leave engineering, uh, even 10 or even less, less than 10 years after being in engineering. Uh, 10% and I think it's like the 10%. So most of them claim that the main reason for leaving was the hostile working environment. So a lot of the reasons why sometimes women find themselves leaving is because it wasn't a welcoming environment. They either got comments like, uh, you're a, a diversity hire or people just didn't treat them as fairly. Like I had an instance where, for example, uh, my coworker, uh, a male coworker, he had a connection with the supplier and he would always go back and forth talking to them he, they will negotiate prices and things like that. When I took over his position and my new job and I went ahead and I tried to do the same thing with my coworkers guidance, they just kind of shut down and said, oh, okay, great, uh, uh, too bad. We'll just see if we get the next job just because they weren't willing. Like they didn't have the same welcoming environment with me. Uh, and, you know, there wasn't really like a, they weren't going to tell me why or why not, but it was kind of really clear why uh, it was just that like harsh, like, oh, okay, no, that's fine. We're not, we don't want to negotiate. But with this other person that was from the same company, uh, had been there for a while, they were just like open and welcome to do it. Um, also, women are uh, more prone to suffer from imposter syndrome. I do have a post on this on my Instagram, maybe you want to look at it. Uh, and especially because of the uh, society's double standards. So a lot of times, for example, say that a man is a leader and then, but if the woman, if a woman has the same characteristics, we try to say like, oh, they're just bossy or things like that. So, so those are some of the things that, you know, we see that we as women sometimes have to have different way of approaching the same things because just by having a different, you know, sex is you're just seen differently. So women in an engineering classroom. So when I was in school, it was uh, about three women per 80, per 80 students in an engineering classroom. So they were very low. And as a Latina, there weren't like, if we were three, there was no chance there was gonna be another Latina in the classroom as well. Uh, what's interesting is that when I started my freshman year, we were about 50% in the classroom. So we were half and half on my Calc 1 class. But I, every semester, it just kept getting smaller, smaller, smaller. By the time I got to my fourth math class, which was my last one, which is differential equations, we were only two women, maybe just one in the classroom. And let's say we were only like 25 students, but that was it. So you see the numbers drastically drop every semester as you advance more into classes that are more specific into engineering. The interesting thing is that women students do as well or better than male students in their coursework. 
yet they continue to leave. So why do they leave? Uh, for example, I when I was going through school, I always felt like either nobody wanted to sit next to me. They would only talk to me when they realized that I knew what I was doing, that I did my homework. And it was a way that you find out like they don't really want to talk to me because I they see me as a person. They see me as like, oh, I can get something out of her. So that was one of the things that make you feel unwelcome, that make you seem like, wait, I don't want to be surrounded like that all the time. Uh, by the way, I don't want to scare you with all of these like numbers because it's not always so bad. When once I started um, my first job, and I think it was when I felt the most comfortable uh, out of you know being five years in engineering school because I don't know if it was that we were more in a professional environment where and where everybody was educated where I was always welcome the older engineers always received me with like they always will stop whatever they were doing to help me if I asked for help uh, they would encourage me to try new things if I would assign something they'll be like let's try and figure it out together and that's when I felt so comfortable and that's when I started my page because I saw that change that it wasn't always you know that negative environment for for women in engineering it just depended of where you were sometimes the school you got uh, didn't really have that much diversity or maybe the job where you are uh, it's more like have like a different mentality where they're used to that men are only the engineers um, so here I have a, a cool graph that shows you, you know, the careers the women, uh, the females uh, choose. And you can see that engineering and computer science are just like the ones all the way down. Um, so engineering and computer science hold the lowest percentage of women. Uh, and while picking a career has to do with what an individual enjoys, there are many other factors involved, such as women experience situations such as being told to pick a more feminine career. Like, we always see it time and time that we have counselors that sometimes can guide us in the right way. And I've also had experiences where they literally tell you, why don't you pick a more feminine career or somewhere that you're gonna enjoy more when they don't really understand that this is what we like, this is what we enjoy. <laughs> okay, uh, another thing is like, there are two engineer roles, the male engineers versus the female engineers. And these are some of the things that I'm just sharing with you that sometimes we see that you know, it's unfair, but that as having like a diverse, I guess, audience, I just want to see like, if you're a man in engineering or in STEM, if you see some of these things, speak up and support us. And if you're a woman, know that you don't have to put up with these things. And these are the things that we're changing to make the environment better, not only for us, but for all the women that are going to come after us. So one of the things I've heard is you're a diversity hire. Women are seen as diversity higher while men are given credit for their skills. So sometimes, you know, they want to make us feel like, hey, I want to be higher because I know how to do my job, not because, you know, they just need that other percentage. Um, and one of the things is like knowing that, you know, you have the education, you have the skills, and you're here to prove that you can do your job and more. And I think that's one of the one of the things I felt when I was changing into my new job. And at the end of the day, I was like, you know what, I've had this much experience. And I know I did great in school. There's no reason why they would only look at, you know, she's a girl versus she's a man and we need that number. Uh, I do have all the experiences that they needed. So again, the imposter syndrome that comes back to you, uh, which is completely normal. And I'll get to how you can combat some of those things. The lack of mentor and role models. Uh, sometimes I feel like there's not a, lo a lot of role models that look like us and uh, they're also not accessible. So some of the things that I will talk about later is like how to reach out to those role models, find mentors, uh, because they're a crucial step in your career, especially succeeding uh, in engineering. Uh, the beauty versus brain. Sometimes women think that they must compromise one over the other and then have hashtags, we can be both because we really can. Uh, we have that mentality where, you know, if you like math and science, then you're a nerd. Uh, but if you're pretty, then you're not smart. And to be honest, uh, now with my Instagram page, you know, I've met so many successful women that are sharing their stories that are helping us change the way that we see those things. And you know, some of them are models, some of them are having in pageants, some of them, they just live their life, but they like to take care of themselves. And that doesn't make them any less of an engineer and they're super successful in their careers. So one, that is something super important to share that we can be both and we don't have to pick either or. Uh, the, Next one is the lack of benefits. So some of the things that I always encounter is like when I was looking for a new job, I would always ask, you know, do you have a paid maternity leave? Because I am in a position where my husband, which is in a different company and it's a man, he gets a paid maternity leave. 
and I don't that I'm a woman. So it's things like that that it still don't make sense sometimes. Um, and uh, some of the things that you know we're working towards. And then the other thing is one of the boys, like being seen like a woman engineer as one of the boys, which is something that we don't wanna see it that way. Instead of making space for women, we're just making the woman be part of the men. But we should instead be making space for like, no, she's a woman engineer and you know, there'll be other ones to come and she doesn't have to adapt to look like them, to dress like them, to act like them. But you know, it should be a diverse environment where they're welcome to be themselves and they don't have to like adapt to like the uh, environment that everybody has been used to. Um, and then the last one that I read in a recent article is that engineering is a profession that is still learning how to take women seriously. So it's something that we're working towards. Okay, so how to succeed in engineering. So I feel like I might have scared you away with all the stuff that I, say, I said, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. You can't be happy and you can't find a, a company that, that will value you and that will make you, you know, push you towards succeeding. So I guess some of the things I share with you are more like, you know, if you're in this environment, then maybe you're not in the right company or maybe your mentor is not really helping you. It's more like, you know, you had to find another mentor. Uh, so how to succeed as a woman, as a first generation student and as a minority. So the first one is role models. You know, if you can see someone that looks like you or that you feel some type of connection or identify with, then it's easier for you to think like, you know, I can do it as well. And I'll expand into these three in the next couple of slides. The next one is networking. You know, finding, I put you try you group of friends where you're comfortable, uh, where you push each other, you inspire each other uh, and make those lasting connections. Uh, and the last one is perseverance. Like I said, some of these topics can be difficult, but they're not impossible. That's literally what I have written, I just said it. Okay, so the first one is role models. So one of the keys to succeed in engineering is to have an impactful and supporting set of role models. Um, what can role models do for you? They can inspire you, they can support you and advise you. They can listen to you if all you need is you know to complain about how difficult this test was. Uh, and they can help you get to have different perspectives. So also keep in mind, I think it was super important that I learned at a conference is that your role model doesn't always have to either be someone that you feel like uh, either represents everything that you, you are or that looks at you or that has a different experience. It is important to have those role models, but also have, I mean, uh, mentors, but also have mentors that might not be like you or might not look like you or might not be the same gender as you because they will help you see things differently, not just from like your point of view. So like you have those mentors that look like you or that are like you, but then you also have the other ones that don't and you can get all those perspectives and you can get like a broader view of uh, difficulties. And you know, each person says things differently. So it's, I think it's a good way to, you know, see everything in a bigger scale. Uh, so how can you find, where can you find role models? Where can you find uh, mentors? So look for role models within your family, your professors, someone in the community and even online or in the media. So when I was going to school, my biggest you know, inspiration was uh, Katherine Johnson. And I actually had like the Barbie doll that I came out with because I would watch the movie. I would put it on the background on my computer while I was studying and just seeing, you know, she wasn't a Latina like me, but she was a minority and she was still through the area where the segregated people. And I feel like if I had come to this country before, I would have been on that, you know, on that scheme too, where I would have been, you know, separated. So. And being a woman, being a woman of color and going into, you know, uh, being super smart, going into a career that, you know, it's complicated or it's male dominated, being one of the only few women in the room, but still, you know, she did her job and she knew what she was doing. And, you know, you feel that empowerment that, you know, I can do it as well. You know, if she went through things maybe a little bit more challenging or like the stuff that she was working on was completely more difficult than what I do every day in my job. So it made me feel like I could do it as well. Um, so that's one that is more like, you know, someone that you won't really meet. Uh, but for example, my mom is also my role model. She had her own business where it was like a male dominated field. And not only did she like, you know, didn't care and when and like was successful, she will bring me along with. So she made me feel like, you know, being in places where I'm the only little girl or I'm the only woman or, you know, things like that was okay. Like I didn't have to feel intimidated. So that was something that really inspired me as well. In the community, uh, in, in your school, for example, your professors, I had two female uh, immigrant women of color uh, 
in STEM um, role models or mentors in during my college years. And that was super helpful because I was just starting my career. And from day one, I had a, that mentor, that role model that I could talk to, that I could share, you know, how my journey was through school. And, you know, when I transferred and I, I went into the university, I also, I saw that there was one female teacher there and I requested that she was my mentor because I wanted to be able to talk to her and ask her questions that maybe I couldn't ask my male professors if I had them as a mentor. Uh, they also, you know, they had their families, but they were also successful in their careers. They had their PhDs. Uh, they were smart. They knew what they were doing. They were teaching us. They had that passion. So it was really helpful to see those role models. The last one is the media because I've seen a lot of accounts in the internet, uh, for example, on Instagram. Uh, but, but with girls or women uh, or anyone in STEM that you might, you know, relate yourself to, uh, sharing their journey, sharing their challenges, their accomplishments, their achievements. And, you know, they're right there where you can send a message request. And I'm telling you from my point of view and from the, my closest uh, network in Instagram that I've met online, that some of them I still haven't even met in person, that we get so excited when we get a message like that, when we get a question, when we can help someone or share like something that helped us, we're more than happy. And I personally, I myself, I posted, you know, calls one-on-one -on -one where I'm like, okay, you have questions or you want to go into engineering what questions can I answer that can help you? And I've even brought my husband along with in some, some of those calls because he's also an engineer. He's in biomedical uh, engineering. And it just like gives you those points of view. So I find it that, you know, if we can help someone, you know, make it there as well, that's what like means to us way more than just us being successful, but, you know, helping other people that are like us or that maybe don't have anyone to answer, uh, ask those questions to, that we can help them as well. So don't be scared of like reaching out and sending a message. The worst thing that you can get is like not an answer or something, but then that's fine. You go ahead and you find someone else that can inspire you. Okay, the third one is networking. Networking can open doors that sometimes education alone can't. So education is good, but when you have a good network, sometimes that helps you get to places that maybe you couldn't because you didn't know anyone else in there. So where can you network? In school and work. So with professor, colleagues, fellow students, being involved in organizations, knowing the faculty. And this is where I think it's super important to have a LinkedIn account as well. Uh, but be active in school when you're attending. Uh, number two is community. Uh, so with other leaders, active members in the community, conference that happen in towns around where you live. So I have been able to meet a lot of the people in my community, in the community college that I went. And, you know, meeting all those different people with different backgrounds and different education and like working in different jobs, it really helps you and it gets you to expand like, you know, what you know. Uh, so I find that one is super interesting because you're not only, you know, narrating to people that are in the same field, but you get a broader, you know, pool of people. Uh, and the last one is online. Like I said, LinkedIn is growing so much and it's super important. That's how people find internships. That's how I find my, my recent job. Uh, that's how you meet uh, other people. You find organizations online that you can follow, that you can learn from, get inspired. Uh, and some of the things that I say is like, you know, send a message, connect with someone. If you have a question, start with that. Send them a question, be like, hey, I saw you here. Uh, can I ask you this question, you know? And, you know, a lot of people are more than happy to, to answer those questions. Uh, but also to keep up with people that maybe don't live like right close to each other. Maybe you met someone in a conference or in an event and then they live in a different country or a different state. You can stay in contact with them and, you know, get up to date to what they're doing. Okay, now this is the third one. The other one was the second one. The third one is perseverance. So engineering is hard, but not impossible. Uh, and then the thing I guess I want to point out is like, were you an A student in high school? Uh, and then I would say goodbye to those perfect scores, but it's not for everyone. Just because I know one of the things that at least it hit me really hard when I did that is I had straight A's when I was a high school student. The moment I hit college, you know, the first test that I, you know, I failed, it was terrible. I felt like, you know, what am I doing here? Um, and yeah, that's, it's just the transition. And sometimes the classes are hard. Like I'm telling you, it took me the whole semester to feel comfortable with the topic. So every semester I started was just terrible and I had to work towards making, get, uh, getting better. So it doesn't, it's not gonna apply to everyone, but sometimes it happens. We might not get those 100% uh, or A's in our, in, our, in our tests all the time, uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It doesn't mean that just because you didn't get a good grade, you're not smart or you're not understanding it. 
Um, it just takes words and it takes perseverance not to give up right away. Uh, topics are complicated, but everyone went through them. Everybody didn't know what you were learning as well, and they had to get through that. And then when you look back like a semester up behind or like a year after, you're like, oh, I thought that was really complicated. And now I'm in like this other class that I think is really complicated, but I finished that one. So I can finish this one too. Uh, and then one thing that's really gonna help you is having that clear goal, you know, this is why I picked this career. This is why I like it. Uh, and then just knowing that this is why you want it and that's gonna push you to keep uh, working towards it. Okay, networking. Did I go back one? Yeah, okay. Uh, last thing is engineering lifestyle. What is it like to be an engineer? So I just have a couple of things I guess that I wanted to share. It's uh, having a fulfilling career. So engineers tend to enjoy the science behind what they do. They tend to geek out on things like, um, like for example, if you show me this new thing, I'll be like, oh my God, it works so cool. And I wanna like pull it apart to see how it works and things like that. So we get excited on all those things. Uh, and we're proud of getting excited. Like I got this uh, pink pen, I'm actually looking for it. Um, it's a pen that has a ruler, it has a screwdriver, it has a leveler and it has all these things, but it's also a rose gold pen. And I got it for my birthday and I was so excited. It was the smallest thing, but it was something that I could use every day from like my job. Uh, so I really like, you can tell that I'm really like enjoying what I do. Like even with my, my collection of gold tools, you know, I don't use those that are on the wall, but it just makes me happy to look at them and see that I combine a tool that's sometimes seen as manly and I put it together with like gold because I really like the color gold. Uh, many opportunities, like I said, you don't have to be specifically an engineer. You can do many other positions just by having that, that degree. And then I've also, there's a lot of options for like, you know, a job that lets you travel a lot or a job that you're there all the time. My first job, I didn't travel at all. This other one, I travel every now and then. I have a friend that just changed jobs. He travels to a new city every single week. And that's what he wants to do. And he's really excited to do that. So you can find not only different types of jobs, but also uh, depending on whether you want to travel a lot or you don't want to, depending on what you want to do. The last thing is stability. If there's one thing I knew from my dad being an engineer was that it was a stable career and that he was having a good life without having to worry too much about, you know, making ends meet or, you know, repaying his education. So this is where I put return on investment on your career because, you know, school is it's expensive and it takes a lot of work. Uh, but when you finish engineering school, a lot of times you get a good job that, you know, you're able to start maybe paying off your loans or start buying your new car. I myself, we just bought a house together, my husband and I. So it makes you feel good as well that you pick a career where you get getting compensated fairly, where you can start, you know, building towards your future, start growing your career, start planning to find a family. So you have the flexibility of also, you know, not only focus on your work, but also have a life outside of it. Um, that is it. And then just last one is, why should I do engineering? So if you want to know why things, how things work and why, if you like challenges and innovation, if you, want, if you don't want to worry so much about finding a job, because there's a lot of STEM jobs created every day and that are open and available. Um, if you want to make an impact on the world or a specific industry, because you can focus, for example, on bigger problems or like, for example, engineering uh, in the environment or you can do you know I just like manufacturing so it depends but you can make an impact depending on what you want to make an impact on uh, flexible and interesting career opportunities and if you like to continue learning that's all for my presentation uh, if you want to connect with me uh, I put my Instagram my website my YouTube and my LinkedIn you can just pretty much search the engineer on the, on the internet and you can find me uh, but I would love to hear about you if you have any questions feel free to either do them here or send me you know a message later in the chat on my Instagram or anything that you know you want to reach out um, and yeah that, that's it <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation, Ms. Richard. That, that was incredibly helpful. And I hope you guys in the audience enjoyed it as well. Uh, a lot of people say that engineering is a very intimidating path. So thank you for it demystifying it a little through this presentation. So now we're going to segue into the Q&A session. Uh, we'll begin with the questions that were submitted during registration and then move on to the questions that were submitted via private chat. So, Ms. Erichata, shall we get into the Q&A session? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so the first question is, when did you know that you wanted to pursue engineering? 
I, yeah, I'm muted, okay. Um, I didn't know what I was gonna do for school at all in college. I just knew I wanted to go into college, but I didn't know what for until I was a senior in high school. So I took physics uh, my last year of, college, of um, high school. And I honestly didn't even want to stay in that class because it was complicated. I was like, how does, I got a bad grade. I never get bad grades in, in my classes. Um, and I just wanted to get out of it. But anyways, I stuck with it. And then I learned that I like how my brain would feel when I would solve a problem, when I figure out, like, I got the right answer. I would get really excited. So even though I was like, getting like the good grades I was used to, I really enjoy the way that this, like how I was solving all these things and how I was applying it to like the world. Um, so I went into college thinking I was going to be a physics major. Once I got into a community college, I was lucky enough to be in a program that was, you know, with all the STEM faculty, all the STEM professors, and we met every every month. I had a mentor, a physics uh, professor that was my mentor, and that really helped me out a lot, um, learn about the options that I had in STEM. And that's how can I ended up narrowing into engineering and then mechanical engineering based on, you know, I like to design, I like the mechanical as it's easier for me to see how things work rather than, you know, electrical that is a little bit more abstract. Um, but it was just kind of like learning on the way. So you don't have to know, know for sure exactly the moment you step foot in college, but uh, you can like, it's always good to like start researching about what you can do and what, what are the options. Yeah, definitely. Solving a problem, like it feels really good when you do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, are there any specific specific courses or extracurricular activities that you would recommend to prepare high schoolers for engineering? If you have um, like a CAD or a 3D modeling class, I know uh, my brother, he's in eighth grade, he's going to go in eighth grade. They do have them already in like junior high. Uh, so I'm pretty sure they have them in high school too. Uh, I would take something like that if you're more like into the mechanical if you have anything that's robotics or like science classes things like that uh that will help you out a lot um and for example other things that might not be you know school related could be like you can buy an arduino online on amazon for like 15 dollars and you can get like uh courses on youtube on how to do them you know i did a led christmas lights last year um you can start doing like, there's a lot of like CAD software that you can download for free. And then I, I literally, what I did in, when I took it in college, it was, I got a book and I was just following step by step on the book. So you can, you don't have to wait into college to learn it. You can start learning beforehand. And then when you get to college, you can like start learning more advanced things. And is it more important to take more like general science classes or more engineering type classes as a high schooler? I think more engineering type of classes because they expose you to what types of engineering or what you like. Uh, and they're not as heavily, you know, like math based. Uh, they're more like understanding the concepts. Uh, so that way you can get an idea of what engineering field you like. Once you get to college, you if you can take, you know, sometimes they take um, like advanced math and science where you can don't take the credits in college. If you can do that, that's great. But if you can get also the engineering courses, because you're gonna take the basics in college and you're gonna take what you need. And if you're really going into engineering, just getting that exposure into, you know, applying it into the real world because there is a change between, you know, learning about fluids and actually designing like something that has to do with how the water's gonna move in the picture or whatever. So, yeah. Okay, so I think we're gonna get into some sort of some of the college related engineering questions. So how attainable are internships or like work opportunities for engineering majors in college or maybe even high schoolers? There is a lot of internship opportunities and there is now different types of, you know, companies and fields. Like I've seen people get into, you know, NASA and like big companies like Google and things like that. But there's also opportunities in small companies, which is the way I went. You know, my dad worked at a company and they were like doing unofficial, just kind of like, oh, if you know someone that's in engineering, we'll take them in because since they were in a big company, they wouldn't put up like applications. It was just like word of mouth, you know, we're going to take interns. Um, this other company I'm in, they kind of integrate with the colleges so you get a little more exposure. But again, a small company, we got two, three engineers and we got a couple of projects and, you know, we bring them along and start teaching them. So there's a lot of opportunities depending on what you're interested. Maybe you're interested in going into this um, 
a specific company. So then you might start looking into starting as an intern together that um that kind of like way to get into it later. Uh, but if not, like for example, I didn't want to you know relocate or go in the summer to live somewhere else. So I would find something local. Um, the, any opportunity that you get is great. You learn a lot and you see the difference from, for example, your first internship to, you know, your second internship, like something that took you all summer. Now it takes you one month, just a year later after you take, you know, you go back to school and come back. And the great thing is that if you do an internship at a company, there are a lot of high probabilities that they might hire you uh, once you're out. Like I, for example, started, um, I did two internships in the same company. And then before I was done with, with college, thank you. Six months before they call me back and they offer me a position. So six months before I was on with college, I already had accepted a position for when I was done. So that was really, really good and really felt really great to to have that already waiting. And is grad school a requisite or a must for engineering majors to get a job? Not at all. Uh, usually what I recommend is that you do your bachelor's, you get experience a work experience and then you go into your um, your graduate studies it doesn't have to be that way it depends on specifically if you have a really specific job that you know requires it then i will say yes go for it if you're not really sure then i will say get your bachelor's then get experience then either companies a lot of times they pay for for graduate school or it helps you understand exactly what you want to do that more education on because you got the experience you know what you like what you don't like um and then you go back and make maybe a better selection or like, I really enjoy this topic. I'm going to do uh, my master's on that. Okay, now we're going to get into some like more of the blocks and STEM kind of questions. And why is it more difficult for certain communities or minorities to pursue engineering? I think um, one of the main reasons is maybe we don't have someone to look at that in, you know, in that field. Um, for example, with Latinas in engineering, you know, we're what, two or three percent in STEM in general. So there's not that many. So sometimes it's just, you know, you don't see it. It's harder to do things. You might not have someone to ask questions to, like, how do you apply? How do you get, you know, the financial aid for it? Um, do I need to do, like, how many years do I need to do for school? What are the areas that I can go in? Um, and also, you know, feeling like, for example, as a woman, as a minority in engineering, it looks like you belong there. So now, okay, I want to do this. I'm in, I'm really interested in this, but I don't look like anyone else and I don't feel welcome. How do you get past that understanding that, you know, but I really like it. I don't care if I don't look like it or I, you know, um, but keep pushing through that. So that's another thing as well that, you know, the diversity may be still not as great, but um, we're getting there. And, you know, I myself, I always say that, you know, being a Latina in engineering, not me, but like everyone else, you're not just doing your career to be successful and to reach your goals. You're also already like, whether you want it or not, being a role model for someone else. Like maybe your neighbor, um, your little girl neighbor sees you and she knows that you're an engineer. Now she can think that she can be an engineer later. Maybe it's your little sister, maybe it's someone else in the family, like your cousin or something. You're already kind of like, just by being you, by going to school, you're already inspiring someone else. And I think that's just great. Um, it makes me feel super proud and it makes me feel happy. Uh, and also like, you know, if you're looking to give back as well, we're gonna create that community where like, maybe you didn't have someone to ask the questions, but now you can answer questions for someone else. Thank you. Um, and what challenges did you, did you face as a minority and how did you overcome those challenges? Um, the very first one was when I got here, just because I was learning English, I had a different culture. So I like sometimes like even the joke, like I would find funny and somebody like everyone else didn't or the other way. So that was uh, something that I guess was a challenge. Like I know people didn't really like, they were like, oh, you're not going to do great because, you know, you come from this other country or your English is like broken and whatnot. Um, but uh but I didn't listen. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to prove you wrong. Not because I want to prove you wrong. Well, I do want to, but because I want to do it. You know, I want to get that perfect GPA when I graduate. And I did. And that's the first thing I wanted to do. I was like, I wish I could go back and show that concert and be like, I did it. Like, you had no credit like telling me why I couldn't do it. Um, once I got to college, I think it was just feeling alone, feeling like nobody looked like me, nobody understood me. Um, 
nobody really wanted to work together. If I was the leader in a group, which most of the times I was because I've always been really, you know, uh, out there. It was really hard to work with my teammates. They didn't, they didn't like me being the leader or didn't want to work. Uh, it was really difficult until my last semester, you know, finally, you know, I was able to pick my, my group and they were all really like, you know, I was the only woman, but I was the leader again. And they even told me, you know, if you hadn't been in charge, we wouldn't have finished this project because you were on it. So things like that, you know, learning how to work with people, the feeling like you don't belong, but not caring because that's what you want to do and that's where you want to be. And, you know, being the first woman in the room, the first woman in the table and being proud of being that first one. Yeah, and this is also something that you touched on in your presentation as well. Uh, have you ever felt imposter syndrome? And when you do, how do you tell yourself that you belong there? All of the time. I felt it when I started, you know, school. I felt it halfway through it. I felt it when I finished. Well, once I had a job, like my first job, I think I felt a little bit like proud. But when I started looking for my this job, which is my second job, the moment I started thinking about applying, I started thinking, you know, I don't have what it takes. Maybe what I'm doing is not really engineering. And when I get to my new job, I'm not going to know anything. Uh, nobody's going to want to hire me. Nobody's going to want to call me back. So it comes back all the time. And I think it's super normal. But I think the thing that we have to understand is that it's within your head. So it's you trying to sabotage yourself. And the moment you know it's just that little voice that you can ignore, you do better because you'll be like, no, like, to stop saying that and you're like I can do it I want to do it and if I don't I'll figure it out um so th that's something that you know I found myself in doing you know two months ago when I was applying it was like like stop listening to that I know I'll be able to do it stop being scared I want to have a new job to be closer to home I'm gonna find a new job to to be closer to home and once I started getting like callbacks I was really I was so happy just by getting like an offer even without like having that new job yet or accepting it I was happy because I made it through so is it worth it while you're scared of and if it is go through it even if you're scared yeah I feel like imposter syndrome is something that a lot of us can resonate with including myself so yeah thank you for that and um how do you react when someone thinks it is strange that you're in STEM because they gender or racial stereotype you? I, oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> I think there's not an easy answer for that because you don't want to, I guess, be mean by making them understand that, you know, why can't I be in STEM or calling them out? But at the same time, it's like, why can't I be in it? So I've had it where they thought I was Italian because I was an engineer and because maybe my skin is just a little bit lighter than your typical Mexican. And so they heard me speaking Spanish. They knew I spoke English and they told me, they're like, you speak Italian, English and Spanish? Like, wow. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm Mexican. I'm proud to be Mexican. I'm an engineer. And that's it. End of story. You don't have to like try to come up with other, like, why would you think something else? Um, so I think also just acting, you know, normal and proud of yourself, you know, why wouldn't I be? Like, why can't I be? And, you know, it doesn't matter if someone thinks or that you should or not be. You're already there and you're going to work to get better. Yeah, and this is sort of a follow-up question. And uh, How do you encourage minorities and women to go into STEM? Um, being out there, uh, sharing things that maybe are uncomfortable for me, like, uh, you know, when I started my first internship, I was getting paid less than my male, my coworker, um, but I didn't stay quiet about it. And it made me really uncomfortable. I waited until the last day to speak on it. But at the end of the day, the company was inclusive. It really, you know, it was more like within, like there was like a gap where they didn't really know. And, you know, I got compensated back to have equal pay through the whole thing. Um, and I saw the difference, like, hey, if I had to stay quiet, that wouldn't have happened. So sharing what, like, your story, sharing uh, your challenges, sharing your success, uh, I guess just putting myself out there to be like, you know, we can do it. There's room for nothing that's in engineering. Uh, one of my friends, Krista, um, Katia, uh, she was sharing, like, for example, us as content creators, sometimes we put ourselves out there. Because when your post is going viral or people start liking it a lot, you start attracting a lot of those negative comments. Like, oh, she's just like being like, you know, uh, what's the word? Like, she's just showing up or like, who said what? And it's just like, and, and we just kind of take it um, 
but we're also like kind of like questioning like pushing those buttons so that people start kind of getting the hint like no like anyone can be an engineer we can look however we want uh, and that's something I really like to do pushing buttons like why can't I be an engineer well why do you think that way and things like that so uh, I'm gonna try to push as many buttons as I can to keep changing you know the mentality so what is your day-to-day -day job like as a mechanical or manufacturing engineer uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my last job and this one. So before I was a little bit more manufacturing where I would do work instructions and how things were like to be done. And then I would train people and sometimes I would learn English and Spanish, which I really enjoy. doesn't mean you always have to have like two languages, but in my case, I was able to use both languages. I was also able to design solutions. If something they did something that took them like 10 minutes, if I could come up with a way or a tool or something that you used to to do it in like half the time, I would like it would it was great. So that's some of the things that I would do. And then sometimes I will help like the design team to come up with designs or drawings and things like that. Uh, in this new job, I it is more design of for automation. I think it's automation design engineer, what they call me today. <laughs> I still think my title is manufacturing engineer, but like besides from that, it's like I'm actually like a design for automation. So I, right now I'm literally building a machine. So like the machine is gonna have cylinders that are gonna push a part out and then the parts are gonna go down and then the next one's gonna come out. And I need that, I need the automation components. I need to assemble the sensors. I need to build a frame and, it is so much that goes into it. Uh, and you have to think about, you know, how much money you have, how much time you have, what are your constraints? So it is definitely a lot of thinking. And it's also something that I haven't done before, before it used to be more like static things, like uh, things that wouldn't really move. And now it's like, you know, you have this machine that's literally moving just with electricity or air. And I haven't done before and I'm literally learning. So this is when I say, you know, it's learning on the go because I had never designed something with the cylinder and now I am doing it. And I just have to be like, let's see if it works. And we'll see in a couple of months when it's done, how it went. So it's super interesting, but it's also something scary. <laughs> what is your advice to future female engineers? Uh, to focus on what is like their passion. If you really like it, if you want to be a mechanical engineer, if you want to be an aerospace engineer, because you're fascinated by, you know, space or airplanes or things like that, do it for you because it's going to be your career. It's going to be what's going to fulfill you. If it's like, if not because someone else says that you can or can't do it, that's not going to matter at the end of the day because you're the one that's going to go to that job and you're the one that's going to come home after it and be happy or not about what you're doing. So if it's something that you like, go against all odds and still go for it and fight for it. Uh, since you mentioned that biomedical engineering is relatively new, is it hard to find a job in that field after college? I don't want to answer that one, but let me tell you that I have heard uh, that it might be a little bit complicated. Um, there's definitely positions for it but also you have to be kind of like in the right area or willing to relocate or willing to maybe take another job while you look for the one that you want. Um, so like, for example, my husband, he studied biomedical engineering, um, but he's working as a continuous improvement manager right now. But you know, his kind of vision wasn't really that he was gonna go into a biomedical engineering position. He was just always interested in, you know, the medicine and the engineering. Um, so it wasn't like his priority to have that job. But I've had also friends that, you know, they either found them really quickly through internships and things like that. And some that, you know, have told like, well, you have to like expand the area where you're looking for. Like same with aerospace. The schools and the jobs sometimes are like in different areas. Like I'm in Chicago. It is not as easy to find, you know, a job here for that. Or there's no schools around the area that have those degrees. So it takes research. So if you're looking into that area, I will research also jobs right now just so that you're prepared that you might have to end up living there once you're ready to take a job yeah that was actually really helpful because that's one major that i'm actually looking into so <laughs> um, uh, since oh sorry what stem classes did you take in high school and what do you think helped you the most to be accepted into your major or what you've heard someone do that stood out to you let me read it again uh classes in high school i took I took biology, sorry, I, I did it in two different countries. So I was like trying to put, 
I did chemistry, but I was always terrible in chemistry. So let me tell you, if you want to be a mechanical engineer and you don't like chemistry, you're fine because you will really like you will use it, but not that much. But chemistry was just I couldn't never. Um, uh, so biology, chemistry, and physics. That was it. That's all I took for for a science. For math, I took all the way up to algebra two. So algebra one, uh, geometry, and algebra two. I, if I, since I moved countries during while I was in high school, it was, I was kind of like a year behind all the time. Um, so I wasn't able to take your typical, like I know a lot of people graduate already taking pre-calc or another class after algebra one. So if you can do that, I mean, I did it with being like basically a year ahead and then I had to test out some classes when I went to college. So if I did it being a year behind, you can do it if you like, you're fulfilling, like you're taking a math class every semester. Um, and then in college, you're always able to like, you know, chemistry, I took it twice when I was in college. Um, and then math, you know, some of the classes, if you're able to test out because you already took them or, you know, sometimes you just have to take them again because, you you know, the first time you just didn't get through you. And then the second time, maybe just a little bit better, but you go through it. Okay, I think we're nearing the end of the Q&A session. So what study habits have you developed when you were an engineering student in college? And what study tips do you recommend for current engineering students? Hmm. <laughs> it's been two years since I was in college. Um, what study tips do I recommend? Um, to do it into chunks. So if you like, don't try to do all your homework in one sitting, it won't happen. Like sometimes even the professor hasn't even gone through that topic yet, but they already assigned it and you're like trying to do it and you haven't even learned it. So the way that it worked when I was in college in my school, because it depends for a professor, every week you had an assignment and you had a whole week to do it. And through that week, the professor will start teaching those topics. So if you try to do homework on day one, you haven't seen any of that. So you won't be able to do all of it. So um, I would do, you know, two problems and then another two or, or you can wait until the last day before, but then it's just going to be hard because you're going to be overloaded and you're going to be like, I can't do this. And sometimes it takes you just to sleep on it to be able to understand the next day. So if you feel stuck and you feel like you don't understand, um, I always take a rest, uh, take a, you know, a nap, go to sleep, uh, go out and then come back it will eventually click in. Nothing is hard enough for you, we won't. Like if you stir it long enough, you're gonna get through and you're gonna understand it. So sometimes I was just tired and it just that wouldn't make sense. So just because it's like, looks like Chinese right now and like you don't know Chinese doesn't mean that it won't like make sense later. So yeah. And finally, do you have any advice for high schoolers that are interested in pursuing a career in engineering? Yeah, uh, yeah. So research what areas in STEM there are, start getting involved. You know, if you are not sure specifically what engineering field you want to go into your first semester in college, there are clubs for engineering. There are clubs that like, you know, that are different, like for example, robotics, and then there's the other one, the Formula One and things like that. You will start meeting professors. You will start meeting other students that are either like a semester ahead or like a year ahead. You start learning like things. So like you see what you like or what you don't. Uh, and then just research, you know, what are the career opportunities? You know, maybe shadow someone that is in, in a job that you wanna do. Um, and then the other thing I was gonna share is internships. You can do an internship before you start college. Like there's no requirement. Like, and I feel like a lot of people don't, don't realize this. They just kind of like went into college and then maybe start looking into internships later. But I had, in some of the companies I've been, we have had high school interns um, where, so you can even start before you graduate. Like you can still be in high school and do like a summer or you can do the summer between high school and college. And I mean, the company is obviously gonna adapt your workload depending on what you know in your age and everything. Uh, and then you start getting exposed because that's super valuable to start getting exposed, not only like learning the things in the classroom, but seeing like learning how a company, the work environment and what type of engineers do what. All right, I think that pretty much pretty much wraps up our webinar today. Thank you so much, Ms. Ircheta. Again, thank you so much to our audience here today as well. And Ms. Ircheta for her time with us today. Uh, if you would like 
to tune into this webinar later or recommend it to a friend. It was recorded and it will be uploaded into our social media platform soon. So make sure you're followed on all of those platforms. Um, I hope you guys have a great day and we'll hopefully see you guys in our next webinar soon. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in guys. Bye.